Welcome to episode 59 of Sport SA Daily Diary. Today we're chatting to the fastest woman in South Africa, sprinter Karina Horn. Afternoon, Karina. How are you doing today? Good, thanks, and you? Yeah, very well, thank you. You've uh, you've been busy during lockdown. A little bit in the beginning, more than now. Um, I was more training in the beginning now, but fixing houses and so on. But yeah, I've been up and down. And uh, have you managed to do training while you're in lockdown? Well, I wouldn't say like athletic specific training, but what I was able to do, I did. Um, so in the garden, I have the space, the little space that you can run and I have a few weights, but not really that that much that I always do. So it's more just keeping keeping myself busy. Yeah, I'm sure it's uh, it's difficult to kind of not do some any of that explosive, uh, quicker t- um, training. Yeah, that's, it's uh, very difficult um, to get the same explosive training on the track and in the gym than in the the garden. Um, mm. But I'm trying to get some. I do a lot of jumps and so on. So. I'm trying to keep everything together with what I have. Okay. And tell us, Karina, have you always been a sprinter since uh, being being young? Uh, not really. Um, so I've actually, because we, we actually stayed in Natal, and there was more of an all-round sport. Then we moved to, to Gauteng, to Joburg, when I was 12, uh, 12 years old around. And... I, did, I was actually really good. My first sport was actually hockey. Played for the nat- national team under 16 and provincials all the time. First team captain of tennis. Um, first, I played with the boys cricket. Um, sure. First team. So I was captain in the provincial team when I was already 13 for the under 19s. So it wasn't really always athletics. It only, athletics only started when I was actually around 18. <laughs> Sure. So you are certainly multi-talented, huh? Um, not only participating in all those sports, but actually excelling in all of those sports. Yeah, I was actually excelling in all the sports um, except athletics. I, I never um, made it up until the same level equal to the to the other sports. So when did you t- um, sort of figure out that athletics may actually be t- um, the sport for you? It actually happened when we were on a hockey tour or a tournament or it was a game. So because I was that fast, I always had the ball. And then the teams eventually after years, they they know the teams and they know the players. So they decided to put three players because there's 11 players in the hockey team. So they decided to put at least three, three players on me and they um, hit my knee. So I was like, it was to the bone, bleeding and everything and I couldn't walk. And I was like, I didn't want to sit out. And after the game, we had to go to the hospital. My parents, and it wasn't the first time, previous times it was my eyes closed. And then I play with a bleeding eye, just lap around my knee and hospitals and indoor hockey and so on. So we, I only get back home at like 12 o'clock at night. And then my mom was just like, said one night with that accident, actually, with my knee. And she just said, you have to decide what you want to do. You can't do everything anymore. Yeah. It's, um too much so then I was sitting by myself it took a, it took a while and then I just thought like okay athletics um is something that I would like because it will everything will depend on me uh, it's not a team sport so I would know okay the effort that I put in um I will get out and there's no one to blame it's not a sports team where I had to pass the ball there I had to do this or everything is on me and that's what I liked and then I just chose athletics so, I mean, how did, was this actually in university that you got into it? Because obviously a, a lot of athletes normally start at school and they start getting noticed at school level, et cetera, et cetera, and get in, put into provincial teams and they, they grow from there. Obviously, that wasn't the case with you. Was this still with university and, and racing? No, yeah, it, let's say I started prof- professionally in 2009, which is say two years later. After, after school in Munich, um, where I started, uh, where my first, I was chosen for the world students for the 200 meters, actually. Um, mm. So after school, I decided, okay, that's what I'm going to do, athletics, yeah. and I will see if it works out. Um, I will give myself a, a 
time period and set goals, realistic goals, and see if I achieve it. And if I don't achieve it, I know it won't work. And then I was actually chosen for the for the world students team for the 200. I've ended ninth in the world that year. Um, sure. So, yeah, and then I decided, and then I got offers from America and this university to go study there after the world students. So, yeah, that that uh, made up my mind. It's like, okay, I made the right choice. So, essentially, you came ninth in the world at the university games with very little to none training, sp- sort of specific sprinting training or coaching or development. Um, I had some uh, coaching and uh in two th- from 2008 2008 and 2009 i had train i've been training and i did train with a lot of good sprinters as well let's say um isabel rule she was the fastest she has been to the olympics in 2008 so yeah, yeah it, it's not like um the other athletes who i competed against like them that has been um stars since um the young school years so yeah. with me yeah i wasn't actually popular in, in athletics in my high school. And, um, I mean, you took to it very quickly. Obviously, you were at the, the World Indoor Champs in 2014, uh, the World Champs 2015. I mean, that's pretty good going for someone who hadn't really been in the sport fully for for much of her life. Yeah, true. Um, that is already when I changed coaches, so that's also an, another story. It's... Um, because I am a South African and the coach we had, we everybody split it up. We were with John Stradom. So everybody split it up. It was all, it was like all the, 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 the sprinters, short hurdles, 400 meter hurdles, everybody was with, with John. And then the, all the training, the group split up. And then I went to Geraldine for, t- I think, a year or two, two years, 2011 and 2012. And in my 2012 season in Europe, I just started to realize while I was in season, um, I have to do something different because my change, uh, my times is not changing. I'm running constantly 11 sevens yeah. and I've been doing it for a few years. So if I want to change something, I have to do something totally different. Um, else I won't get anywhere. I mean, 11 seven is okay. You can be a, a South African champ with the 11 seven, um, but to get somewhere in life with athletics, you have you have to run it at least 11 three. Yeah. So then I changed my, my coaching to an Austrian coach. And yeah, since 2012, he was, it was totally different training. And he said, he can't promise me anything. It's a risk that I'm taking. It's a risk he's taking. And we were both prepared to, to, to take the risks and see if it's going to work. And yeah. <laughs> thankfully it did. Um, Karina, you've been six-time national champion. Um, was that kind of where that started to take off once you changed your coaches? Um, yeah, in a way. Um, when I st- started to change my coach to the Austrian coach, Rainer Shop, um, we weren't really that into um, South African athletics because of um, I needed more training. Um, different training. So the, our season, South African season is too early for us, um, especially when I do indoors as well. So January, February, I'm in, at indoors to see if the training is working. So coming from indoors, I had the one year in 2016 with the Olympic year, I basically had an indoor season. I wasn't prepared to race in South Africa, but you have to run a few leagues and the national champs to be selected for the Olympic team. So I actually had to fly back um, and I had two days rest from an indoor season and I had to run the 100 meters. So it's quite difficult to focus on the South African season. So it's not that important for us. Um, and I think it was 2013, the nationals in, in Poch, 2013 or 2014, I can't remember, that I was um, there as well. So going to the national champs, the only time I was really prepared for it was 2018. Hello? I was in the 4x100 meter, um, yeah. 
been to the Olympic Games in Brazil. You've continued to go to the World Champs. Um, highlight of your career to date? Sorry, did you get that question? You broke up a little bit. I don't know if you heard um, everything I said. No, I, I sort of lost you um, when I was chatting about uh, you winning a um, uh, gold medal at the African Champs 2016, going to Olympic Games, go, continuing um, with success at World Champs. Um, has there been a highlight in your career to date? Can't, can't hear you. Uh, softly. Softly. There we go. There we go. Got you back there. That's Better. good. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, up to date, I would say there's two um, that will stand out for me. It's just the South African record. The first one I broke in Pretoria, the 11.03. Um, it was at home. My family was there. And then the, the highlight and a dream that actually came true was the 10.98 in Doha. I would say that's that's the most important highlight so far. And Karina, I mean, what does it feel like to be the fastest woman in South Africa? I mean, that's quite an achievement. Yeah, it's um, it's actually weird. I haven't ever really thought about it in that way until a few, like maybe two or three years ago. Um, because I've never set uh, a, a goal to be the fastest in South Africa. So I only realized that after I broke the South African record the first time. Uh, yeah. And I was like, okay, you are the fastest ever in South Africa. And yeah, it's a, it's a good feeling. It's it's um, something that, that you can put on a CV and be proud of. And not everybody can break a record and say they're still the fastest because there's a lot of records been broken so it's <laughs> luckily for me yeah i can say that yeah i mean it's, it's certainly something that will live with you forever it's a, a legacy that you'll have forever um to pass down and i mean it's a, it's quite the achievement um karina you you run 60 meters you run 100 meters and you run 200 which is your favorite of the three well my the 100 is is my event uh, it was never. My 200 was always the better event. But uh, when I started with the Austrian coach, with, with Rainer, um, we decided to focus on one because I don't want to, like, do two different events and never achieve something. So we said, I'm, I want to focus on the 100. And I can say you're the fastest where I focus on the 200. It's not really, let's say, a status that you can say that you are the fastest, so we decided to go on 100. But I really do enjoy the 60 meters as well, even though my start wasn't always that good. And I, it's a different excitement that you get from from the mm. indoors. Yeah. yeah. And uh, tell me, obviously, you, when you got into the sport quite late, did you have a icon or somebody that you looked up to in the sport? Or was it kind of a bit too late and it was just really, you were just doing what you needed to do? Yeah, um, I I do like um, a role model for me. is not someone that's doing athletics. It's um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. So <laughs> yeah, I look up to him. I like the, the the his outlook towards towards life. And yeah, that's. But in athletics, I just um, focus on what I need to do and have motivation from a guy like like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And um, obviously, there's there's dreams and aspirations for the future. Um, the Olymp obviously, the 2020 Olympics was on the cards. That's obviously now been pushed uh, back to 2021. But uh, you had a bit of a, a, a rough year last year. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it was a shock for me that when I got a call from an investigator. Um, what happened is I, had a, I went for a season in Europe in June. Well, I actually went in May already. My first race was early in June until middle of July. And then at the meeting in, I think it was Switzerland, we realized I only had a few days left for visas and I still have races in August. And I want to be with my coach in Europe still before the world champs. So I need a certain days on in my visa um, to stay in Europe. 
So I just we decided to fly directly from the meeting back to South Africa, else I wouldn't have been able to get my days inside. And when I arrived back in South Africa, I had to buy my new supplements that I used there as well, like creatine, um, a pre-workout, and protein shake, and amino acids, and what was the other one? BCAs. And mm. so normally I have my brands that I use that I know is fine for years. And yeah, I never bought, so I just went to a Chrome shop in Midland Mall. Um, I bought what I could get, did some research and talked to the people before I spoke, or well, before I bought and said it's fine. And so I started to use that for the first time. And I went off back to Europe after a month. And the day of my arrival, or the day after my arrival, I got... Um, the doping people arrived, I did the tests, and I did, I think, two or three more races, came back before I had to leave again to Europe for my days, and I got the call while I was in South Africa that said there was two substances found in my urine, and didn't know what it was, and yeah, it was, it's a feeling you can't describe, it's, mm. you are heartbroken, and it's emotion, emotionally, it's been rough and it's like something you never think can happen and yeah I had I missed the world champs as well and I got a lawyer from America so we started with my case I had to send in my supplements um, for testing then the ones that I wrote on because when you get tested you have to write the supplements that you use so they had to um, I had to go buy uh, a closed a sealed one as well so my open ones with a sealed one with the same batch numbers, send it to the labs. Unfortunately, I couldn't send it to America. DHL didn't want to send it without slips, um, with the open ones as well. So I didn't have the, the, the old ones. So they arranged to test it in Bloemfontein. So I drove to Bloemfontein twice to drop up of supplements. And then they found the supplements in a pre-workout, um, which is good for me, which um, showed that I'm not guilty. Um, mm. But... The lab in Luzon wanted to do the test as well. So the, I had eight supplements being sent. The lab only sent four. So the other four must still be sent. And it was two days before the lockdown. So they're still waiting for the other four. Um, but the good news is that the results so far is the same as South African lab, where they also found the uh, supplements in a pre-workout, which only said it is uh, caffeine. And I mean, tell me, what is the, the way forward now? Um, have you obviously taken this up with the, the um, retailer that you bought it from? Um, how do you, you know, get back to training? When can you get back to competing? I mean, it, it must be a really trying time for you. It's, yeah, it's been difficult. Um, emotionally, I've, I've, I've been broken down. Um, it's a different mindset as well. If I go back to the track, um, it's going to be totally different. You have mm. to have a different attitude because of um, people have their own stories, so they're going to treat you differently. So you have to be ready for, for everything. Um, mm. I, I hope to be back on the track next year. It looks good. I will be back on the track next year. Mm. It's just um, whether I'm going to be ready to compete or not. So I will still decide on that. Um, because I've been out for almost, yeah. well, when I didn't train, I got the call in September. I've only started training this year. And so, and it's also not been the training that I had to do. Mm. Um, so I, I know I, the training that I need to start to compete again is not up to, up to, to date and up to form. So, and emotionally I have to get, I have to be ready. Emotionally I have to be much stronger than I was before. So, and the off track um, emotions is worse than the on track emotions. So, mm. I still have to decide when I will be back on track. But with the case, I it will be sorted this year, and I will be ready to go back. It all depends on me emotionally. And uh, Karina, I mean, it's it would be quite easy just to sort of crumple and give up and stop competing. Do you think this situation has made you tougher? Definitely, yes. Um, definitely. I wanted to 
even before this case, there's a lot of times that you want to give up. With the, especially with this case, emotionally, I wanted to give up many times, several times, where you just like you don't know whether it's ever going to be right. Especially with all the admin when the lawyer calls, especially he's from America. So, and it's uh, things that I never ever thought about that they ask and just all these yeah. little things that adds up and makes you 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 overthink actually everything and just um yeah the, it makes it difficult it makes your training more difficult um because you don't know whether you're training for something and i like to have goals and know what i'm training for mm. and the effort that you have to put in is something totally different so yeah it's 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 been hard but mm -hmm. it made me tough I'm sure, I'm sure. And Karina, I mean, if you had to give advice to a young athlete who not necessarily been in a similar position, but has been stuck, uh, whether it's 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 from a, um, a product that they've taken or whether it's a, a bad injury, I mean, you've obviously learned from this. What advice would you give to a young athlete um, out there to, you know, who's also maybe going through this similar situation to you? Yeah, I just want to say, just follow your heart and believe in in your passion, and don't let other people destroy your dreams, um, because that's what people like to do. Even whether you are what in whatever sport you are as well, um, people like to add their stories, and especially with me as well, the comments that you see on social mm -hmm. media that's totally destroying you as as a person and your career. So. Um, Never give up on your dreams. Follow your heart. Um, have um, follow that passion that you have, um, because that's what makes you want to live. Um, and the a live, a life worth living is to follow your dreams. Take the risks. Um, yeah. Don't be afraid to take the risks. Are you still passionate yeah. about the sport? Definitely. Um, I thought I lost it, and I think, in a way. Um, it made me find the passion. I think maybe I lost it um, somewhere during the line um, where I was just happy with running 11-1 or 11-2 or whatever. Um, training gets difficult. Um, your life off track has to be more important as well to be uh, the best on track. So mm -hmm. that was also a bit ups and downs, which makes it difficult. So I think the situation that actually set me back actually brought the fire back and mm. made me realize it is still what I want to do. So like it gave you a chance to give up if it wasn't really what you wanted to do, but it made me realize, yes, that this is still what I want and realize there's so much more that I want. Mm. And thinking years ago, I would have been just happy with being at the Olympics and the goals is changing. Like now, I wanted to be at the semi-finals. Now it's like you want to be in the final. Now you want the gold medal. Um, so it's constantly changing, and that's what you when you realize as well. It's like you don't you don't ever get enough. You always want to be better, and that's that's um, yeah stronger than ever before. Which is a really a great insight to have. I mean, you know, if you set your your goals that okay, I just want to make the semi-finals or I just want to make the final. You'll achieve those, and then there'll be nothing um, going forward. So, is is the dream for an Olympic medal? Definitely, yes. Um, they, I really want an uh, Olympic medal. I really want to be the fastest in the world as well. Um, so, this, yeah, it's it's far fetched, but also not. Um, when I competed. The thing is, um, with Kamalita Jetta, I spoke to her as well mm. last year. So I've been, I've been, the, let's say the top eight women in the in the world, I've competed against, and I've beaten. Even mm. Chile Ann, I've beaten two years ago. So, which made me think like anything is possible. Um, it's just that little things that makes big things when you get to competition. Yeah, and Karina, just in closing, how supportive are the other athletes of each other? So, it's sort of in the situation that you've been going through, have they been supportive or or not? Um, and in similar situations, if you get injured or something, are they all very supportive towards each other, or is it very much individualistic? Um, very much individual, uh, individualistic. I think um, 
there has been um, one from Jamaica that's been really supportive. Um, she has gold medals, silver medals at World Champs and at Olympics. Um, she's been really helpful and supportive, but um, she's not competing since last year anymore. Um, so I would say the people that's still competing, no, they all, all for, for themselves. And But I also think it's it's the competitiveness. So you don't really want to get emotionally involved. Like if I would say if, some, if something like this happened to another competitor, which I know also happened at the same week with my case, but she's already back from a different country. It's like you don't want to get involved emotionally in, in something like that because your, your training, your focus, your day, is actually full, um, full of focus of, on yourself. So you don't really have time to to yeah. be there and support because it's really draining. So you don't want to take it away from you. Yeah. Uh, I certainly get that. Karina, it's been lovely to chat to you this evening on Sport SA Daily Diary. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, good luck with the rest of the case. Hopefully it, it goes the right way very soon and we see you on the track uh, at the upcoming Olympics. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. Thank you. It's been great. Don't miss tomorrow's episode of Sport SA Daily Diary where Ron Rutland tells us about riding his bicycle through every country in Africa.